Let's turn back in our Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 52. And uh, as you do that, let me lead to the prayer and ask for God's help as we come into this final chapter of uh, Jeremiah. Heavenly Father, as we come one last time, and for now at least anyway, to the book of Jeremiah, we pray that by your Spirit, you will write in our hearts the lessons you have preserved here for us and help us to truly live in the light of them. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It was seven months ago, back in October, when we started to work through God's word to us, through the prophet Jeremiah. And uh, I personally, back then, felt a bit daunted. It's the largest book of the Bible, just over 5% of God's word. And today we come to the last chapter and our last sermon in Jeremiah. And I know, I know it's not been easy in places. Today's reading wasn't easy to hear, was it? But we have been so blessed by this book. It has exposed our hearts, shown what we're really like. It's excited us about Jesus, and it has equipped us for living in exile. Let me explain that last one. God's people were persistently rebellious. For 40 years, through Jeremiah, God warned them that if they carried on, he would allow them to be invaded, their city would be destroyed, and they would be carried off into exile. Well, the last chapters of Jeremiah record that happening. They were invaded. Jerusalem was destroyed, and the people were taken off into exile in Babylon for 70 years. For many, it was a lifetime in exile. Well, this is a help for Christians today because the New Testament tells us that we, if we believe in Jesus, are exiles in the world. From the moment we became a Christian, we have a lifetime, however much of our life is left, in exile. We are far away from our real home, which is God's heavenly new creation. We're not there yet. We're far away from home. But we've also seen through Jeremiah wonderful promises of the end of exile and of the restoration of God's place. For us, that will be the new creation where there will be no more crime or sickness or pain or death. There have been three clear sections in Jeremiah. I'll just quickly remind us, as it's our last uh, sermon in the series. Chapters 1 to 29 was God's account of Judah's sin and what he was going to do about it, the promise of exile. And then in chapters uh, 30 to 33, we have those wonderful chapters. This is the high point of the prophecy and the heart of it. God's promise of restoration and relationship with him through a new covenant of grace. So this is the good news in Jeremiah. But we only see how good the good news really is against that dark backdrop of Judah's terrible sinfulness and the promise of judgment. But when you see that, well, when you see how wonderful the gospel is, God's gospel of grace through a new covenant. And then, these last chapters, we've seen more accounts of sin and of God's judgment against Judah and against the nations, in fact, actually being carried out. And this is really how the book of Jeremiah ends. If we were hoping for a happy ending, well, this is not it. It's another sobering account of the destruction of Jerusalem and the exile of God's people. It's not a happy ending, but it is a hopeful ending. It's not a happy ending, but it is a hopeful ending. It's an end ending that actually wasn't written by Jeremiah. So if you just have a look at the end of Jeremiah chapter 51, the previous chapter, it ends by telling us the words of Jeremiah end here. So chapter 52 is an editor's concluding summary. The prophecy has ended, and this is now the history, the history of what happened, which confirms that Jeremiah's prophecy was absolutely true. You can tell it's history, can't you? It's written by a historian because of all that detail about the number of pomegranates on the pillars in the temple, and the precise numbers of people that uh, were taken away into exile. This is history confirming that the prophecy was true. If you recognise much of what happened, 
in this chapter, there's a reason for that. The siege of the city, the attempted escape of the king and the capture and the blinding of the king and the destruction of the city are all recorded in chapter 39. So this chapter underlines that those things really did happen. I think we're being told to not quickly skate over the judgment of God. It is real, it is devastating, and it is coming. And our series, as our series in Jeremiah draws to an end, let's learn three things from this final chapter. The first is coming up on the screen. We get here a final confirmation. God's word comes to pass exactly as he says. Final confirmation. God's word comes to pass exactly as he says. Nearly every verse in this chapter is the fulfillment of prophecy, of things that uh, Jeremiah said were going to happen. Jeremiah prophesied that enemies would come from the north. Well, they did. The Babylonians came down from the north. Jeremiah prophesied that they would lay siege to Jerusalem. Well, that's exactly what they did, as you can see in verse 4. Jeremiah prophesied that the whole land would be ruined and it would be burned to the ground. But indeed it was. Verses 12 to 23 recount the temple and the royal palace being set on fire and the city walls being broken down and the temple being pillaged. Jeremiah prophesied that there would be famine and death in the streets. And so it was. Verse 6 tells them there was no food for the people to eat. Many would have starved. And this gruesome chapter tells, of a, tells us of a number of people who were executed. Jeremiah had personally and repeatedly warned King Zedekiah that unless he repented, he personally would be handed over to Nebuchadnezzar. Well, sadly, he failed to repent. And so in verses 9 and 10, he and his family were all handed over to Nebuchadnezzar with grim consequences for them all. Jeremiah prophesied that the Babylonians would loot the temple. Verses 17 to 23 recount the looting in great detail. The historical facts speak for themselves. All these things show us that Jeremiah was indeed a true prophet of the Lord. That this is God's word, it is truly God's word, that these words should have been and must be taken seriously as the words of God. But it's easy for us to see that the people of Judah back then should have taken the warning seriously. But why should we today take this stuff seriously? Well, because, as I've said a number of times before, every time we read of God's judgment in the Old Testament, it is a tiny little picture of the far greater judgment that he has promised, which is coming on the whole world, on all people, in all generations, in all nations. As he did back then, God kindly has kindly warned us of his judgment that is coming. He has warned us through the prophets, like Jeremiah. But then he actually came into the world himself to warn us. Jesus spoke of the coming judgment very many times and warned us of the danger of hell for those who continue to ignore God. In Matthew 25, he tells us what will actually happen on that day. I'll put it on the screen for you. He says, when the Son of Man comes in glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. We have seen in Jeremiah chapter 52 that God's word of judgment comes to pass exactly as he said it would. God's word has been fulfilled, but
But let's be assured that God's word will be fulfilled. God means and does what he says. And that's why we today must take these words of the Lord Jesus Christ seriously. I mean, only an utter fool would bet against it and ignore them. Every word that God has spoken in Scripture has come to pass. There's one remaining. Jesus is going to return and judge the nations. Let's be in no doubt that God's word comes to pass exactly as he says. The Apostle Paul wrote this to the Thessalonian Christians. It's on the screen. You know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labour pains on a pregnant woman and they will not escape. Do you remember the people in Judah, even the religious leaders in Judah, were saying peace, safety, peace and safety, they were saying. They were saying, don't listen to Jeremiah. He's just trying to frighten you. There's nothing to worry about. Everything's going to be fine. But it wasn't. People today are obsessed with trying to create peace and safety. Like we're not doing a great job here, are we? We, are, we naively think that we can keep ourselves completely safe and live in peace. And we assume that we do not need to concern ourselves with the word of God that tells us of the greatest danger to the human race. That Jesus Christ will return as the judge of the world and bring devastating and inescapable destruction on those who continue to ignore him. We think we don't need to worry about that. We somehow think that we can escape and that it won't concern us. In Jeremiah 52 verse 8, King Zedekiah thought he could escape, didn't he? He thought he could nip off through the uh, hole in the wall. We're told in chapter 39. And that he could do a runner, get off uh, away from this judgment. But he couldn't. He was caught. He was rounded up. His family were killed. He was blinded and carried off into exile. Let's see this final confirmation that God's word comes to pass exactly as he says, which means that one day Jesus will return and judge all humanity, including us. Now that being so, we need to see a second thing. We've seen the final confirmation. God's word comes to pass exactly as he said, but we also need to see a final warning being shut out of God's presence is utterly devastating. So, keep trusting Jesus, or start trusting Jesus. Perhaps the headline from this final chapter is at the end of verse 3. I'll put it on the screen. The end of verse 3 says this. In the end, the Lord thrust them from his presence. In the end... The Lord thrust them from his presence. God forcibly sent his people away. It's a bit like what happened in Eden, right at the beginning of the Bible, in Genesis, when Adam and Eve were banished by God from his place, Eden. We're told there that he drove them out. And here again, God thrust his people from his presence. Although the Babylonians were the agents, of God's judgment against Judah, would be no doubt that this was God's judgment against his people. The judgment that Jeremiah had been prophesying about for 40 years. And then at the end of verse uh, 27, we're told, it's on the screen again, so Judah went into captivity away from her land. Being thrust from God's presence is devastating. It's a short phrase, but it is utterly devastating. Just see what it meant for them then. Verse 6, the people starved. So there was a loss of God's provision. Verse 13 and following, the buildings were burned and destroyed, so there was nowhere to take refuge. Verse 17 and following, the temple was desecrated and ransacked and pillaged, so there was nowhere to meet with God. Verse 27 and following, the priests and the other leaders were executed, so there was no leadership and direction. Verse 28 and following. 
The survivors were deported. Thousands of people led off into slavery and exile in Babylon. The numbers mentioned in verses 28 and 30 refer to just the adult males. There were thousands of women and children too. Those numbers are recorded in the book of 2 Kings for us in chapter 24. It was probably at least 20,000 people deported. Now this is just a little picture of what being thrust from God's presence is like. There's loss of God's blessings and provision. There's no refuge. There's no escape. There's no leadership, just chaos. There's no relationship with God. Sent far away from him and from the good things he has made. It is frightening. It is devastating. Well, there's a sober warning here for us all. See, God's people were living in God's place as his people. But their rebellion had become so great that he, drew, he drove them away from his presence and he allowed everything that represented his presence and his blessing to be destroyed. Well, you might not appreciate how terrible and terrifying this is being thrust or cast out of God's presence. Let me tell you that being thrust from God's presence is the kind of language the Bible uses elsewhere to describe hell. It is to be eternally cut off from God and from all the good things he's made for us to enjoy. This scene in this chapter of utter destruction and being thrust out of God's presence is to be for us a little watered down picture of hell, of being eternally cast away from God's presence and blessing. And I reckon that holds a very sobering warning and serious warning for both the church and for the world in general. Let me first apply this to the church. You see, we have a lot in common with the Jews who were deported. They had God's word. They had God dwelling with them. They were God's people, but they were unfaithful to him. The church has God's word. We're holding it in our hands right now. Yeah, you can join me up here, that's fine. Don't you worry, it's fine. We have God's word in our hands now. We have God dwelling with us by his spirit. We are God's people. We are his adopted children. But no church and no denomination holds God's permanent, unconditional approval. See, if we reject his word, like they did back then, if we deny his truth, if we allow ourselves to worship for the false gods of our age, then the church could lie desecrated and deserted, like the temple in Jerusalem did. In Matthew 24, just before Jesus spoke of his coming judgment, he said this. It's on the screen. Jesus said this. Many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. Whoa, isn't that sobering? The love of most will grow cold, said Jesus. Maybe it's as, it's as the church persists in affirming and approving wicked things that God's word says are wrong, that people's love for Jesus is growing cold. And they're falling away. Up and down the country, our buildings are beginning to lay empty. In time, they will be turned into bars or knocked down and become blocks of flats. All our Bibles will be recycled. Our religious artifacts, fonts and pulpits and lecterns and stained glass will be uh, sold off at auction, perhaps become decorations in themed restaurants. Like Jerusalem and its temple, the church could become another spiritual wasteland. You see, if it could happen in God's own temple, in the heart of Jerusalem, it really could happen anywhere. We're already seeing it. And so the book of Jeremiah calls us to faithfulness, to not turn away from the true and living God, to not be those who like a bit of weekly religion, 
but who don't really love Jesus. To not be those who believe and trust everything in the newspapers or that the BBC tells us, but who don't take God's word seriously. This is why meeting together as church around God's word is so, so important. You see, God has given us to one another to help us to remain faithful and to keep going until we either go to be with the Lord or until he returns. Only the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. But this is not just a warning for the church, it's also a warning for all who persist in rebellion against God and against his rescue. See, for those who reject God's saviour, the full and ultimate outworking of the judgment that Jeremiah proclaimed is still to come. And so his message remains as real and as urgent as ever. Without Jesus, our friends and our families and our neighbours and our colleagues and our acquaintances are on a collision course with the living God. The fall of Jerusalem and the exile in Babylon were expressions of God's holiness. He could not allow sinful people to remain in his presence and to remain under his blessing. That's why he sent them into exile. God cannot have sinful people in his presence. But through Jesus, he has graciously opened a way for us to be made righteous, to be made right with God, to be made fit for his presence, to be adopted into his family as his children, to receive his eternal blessings. That's what Jesus offers. But if we reject Jesus, if we reject the Saviour, well, then there's no salvation. How can people be saved if they don't want the Saviour? Just listen to the language the Apostle Paul used to describe the consequences of rejecting the Saviour. He wrote this. He will punish those who do not know God and who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out of the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might on the day he comes to be glorified. Uh, can you see how the destruction of Jerusalem back then and the thrusting out of God's people back then from his presence was just a teeny weeny picture of the ultimate judgment that is coming on the world. Destruction. Everlasting destruction shut out from the presence of the Lord, these images and these words should compel all of us who know and love Jesus to proclaim the gospel of salvation to everyone we know. And they should compel everyone who hears the message of Jesus to gladly and immediately receive God's salvation. Over the next two months, we're running a number of events here at St Andrews under the banner Passion for Life. Shah mentioned it to us in the notices. The idea is to give us all an opportunity to invite our friends and our loved ones to come and hear something about Jesus. There's going to be a men's pool and dance tournament. There's going to be a ladies' night. There are a couple of afternoon teas for seniors. There's a family quiz. At each event, there's going to be a five-minute talk about Jesus. Five-minute gospel talk. What an opportunity. I don't know your friends. I can't invite them. Chances are no one else here knows them either. Your friends will only hear the life-saving news of Jesus if either you tell them or if you bring them to something where they can hear about him. So um, please, take one of these today from the table in the foyer. It's got a list of the events. Let's start praying for these events and for those who we would like to invite to come to one of them. And let's get inviting. Apart from Jesus, there is no way for anyone to stand in God's presence on the day of Christ's return. Jesus is coming. Judgment is coming. God's word says, God's word says it, and as we have seen, God's word will always come to pass exactly as he said. 
So let's not bury our heads in the sand. Let's not presume that there will be another opportunity to either to come to Christ or to invite our friends to hear about him. Today is the day of salvation, and Jesus is the only way of salvation. <coughs> Knowing and trusting and believing in Jesus is absolutely essential for everyone who wishes to stand in God's presence and not be thrust away from him. Well, speaking of Jesus, let's finish, as this book of Jeremiah does, with a final word of hope. God's Saviour King is coming. Final word of hope. Now, don't be distracted by the uh, name of this Babylonian king, evil Merodach. That is a Hebrew translation of his Babylonian name, which was Awel Marduk, or Amel Marduk. Despite his name, he actually turned out to be a good guy. Just have a look at what he did in verses 31 to 34. I'm going to read this little paragraph again to us. In the 37th year of the exile of Jehoiachin, king of Judah, in the year the evil Merodach became king of Babylon, he released Jehoiachin, king of Judah, and freed him from prison. On the 25th day of the 12th month, he spoke kindly to him and gave him a seat of honour higher than those of the other kings who were with him in Babylon. So Jehoiachin put aside his prison clothes, and for the rest of his life ate regularly at the king's table. Day by day, the king of Babylon came, gave Jehoiachin a regular allowance as long as he lived till the day of his death. Do you know, this last paragraph would have assured the first readers that God's plan of salvation was still on. Let me explain. You know that God had promised that he would put a son or a descendant of David back on the throne. And from him would come an eternal king and saviour for the world. Well, King Jehoiachin, mentioned in verse 31, was a king from the line of David. Even through the exile, the line was not broken. Sure, he'd been in prison for 37 years, but he was still alive. And here we see that he was set free. So mention of Jehoiachin would have assured the exiles that the promise of a descendant of David, who would be a saviour king, was still on. He is coming. And sure enough, God's word came to pass exactly as he said. In Matthew chapter 1, this king Jehoiachin is mentioned in Jesus' family tree. Wonderfully, these verses don't just assure the exiles that the promised saviour king is coming. They also give us a little hint of what he will do for all who put their faith in him. See, after nearly four decades in prison, King Jehoiachin, king of Judah, was set free, and he was given new clothes to wear, and the prison rags were thrown away, and I imagine he was given some royal robes to put on. And he was given a seat of honour and allowed to eat at the king's table, surely a sign of relationship. And then in verse 34, he was given a daily provision. This was happening to one of the exiles, one of the people who had been thrust away from God's presence. This is the gospel. We who due to our sin cannot approach God and could not survive in his presence through the gospel of Jesus Christ, are set free from our sin. We are given the righteous robes of Jesus to wear, clothed not in our sin, but in his righteousness. We have a real relationship with the living God. We're invited to eat at his table and to share that meal of Holy Communion until that great feast that we will one day be at. We are given daily provision, everything we need to keep going until the day Jesus returns. Make no mistake, one day he will return as the judge of us all, and it will be eternally and utterly devastating to be found wanting on that day. But for now, we live in a time of grace when all who come to him will be saved. Will you pray with me now? <coughs> Heavenly Father, Thank you so much for all that you have shown and taught us through your word. Thank you for your justice, perfect justice that will not allow sin and wickedness to go unchecked. But thank you too for your amazing grace 
for the fulfilment of your promise of a saviour king from the line of David. Thank you for Jesus. Help each one of us to live by faith in him and then with a sense of urgency seek to share the gospel with our friends and family and neighbours and community before it is too late. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name and for your glory. Amen. Amen.